Hello everyone and welcome back to the table. This is going to be the first kind of inaugural video of the Classic Games Collection. Classic Collection. Still trying to think of a fancy grabber name for it. But this is where I'm going to take a look at classic games, whether they be out of print or maybe just real popular but have aged and uh, maybe share them with you. And again, I just want to say thank you to my friend Tom, whose collection I'll be delving into first. He's actually got quite a few classic games that I want to share with everyone, kind of creating an online museum, I guess, of these games. So we'll go ahead and take a look at what comes in Tokyo Express. That's the first one we're going to take a look at. Now, I know little to nothing about Tokyo Express other than what I've read on the box, but I do know that uh, Victory Games, they created some, uh, I guess, really classic solitaire games. One of them was Carrier, and that came before Tokyo Express. Tokyo Express came second, and this is talking about the battles of Guadalcanal. The night battles, especially the Tokyo Express, where uh, Japanese were trying to rush troops in to take over, I think, Guadalcanal, and then the Americans were there to try and stop them. A lot of intense fighting that led to the nickname Iron Bottom Sound. So apparently a lot of ships were sunk in this time frame of the war, of World War II. And this is a solitaire game for that. It also has a two-player version, which is in the rules. And this is just taking a look at the box. Yeah, when I first approached my friend Tom about showing his games, he was kind of like, well, some of these boxes are in rough shape. And it's like, you know, that's okay, because the box does what it's supposed to do, and it protects the content. Um, so this is kind of the original box. We've got that it's a solitaire two-player variant is included, has basic scenarios. The I won't read all of this to you. You want to see components. But uh, it does include rules for a basic game, it has a standard game, and then finally advanced game. Uh, and it's in a kind of a structured learning system. So you read the basic booklet first, play a few games of the basic game, and then you can move on to the standard game. And then finally advanced game has rules that you can kind of add in to really flesh it out. And there's a lot of components on the inside here. So the complexity starts to chart towards very high where the arrow, arrow goes. And I did see on Board Game Geek, the, I think John came on there, John Southard, Southard, and he popped on and he said, like, you know, he's humble that people still talk of the game. And he's, he said he kind of apologized that the game was so complex. But in order to get the operational aspect of the game that they wanted, it had to be complex. And as I was reading, there the basic game isn't doesn't seem all that complex, but there's a lot of mechanics and charts involved to help run the AI of the, the Japanese ship. So as I delve deeper in, I might start to really see some of the complexity. But let's go ahead and open it up. I did have a chance to look at this when I was at, uh, at my friend's house. Ugh and saw some of the components. So this isn't stacked, you know, as in exactly as you get it maybe mint. So first thing we have is the basic game book. Now the basic game book does tell you to go and read the basic concepts of the game here in the standard game book. And then you, uh, you come and read the basic game book. The basic game book, I actually, I'll tell you, this is laid out really, really well. This is actually probably some of the best rules I've ever read for a war game. And I think even though they're, the game might be considered fairly complex, the rules, at least for the basic game, are laid out fantastic. Sequence of play is explained very well. It tells you exactly what pieces you need to run the basic game. What I really like is it has design notes to explain the concepts they're trying to get to you. And there's a lot of examples for each of the section of rules. And they're easy to find. I like the fact that they use different colors to point out the, where the rules changes occur. So like, you know, 3.1, bright, bold, red. It really lets you know, okay, here's the next section of rules that I'm reading. So every new concept is, is bolded and highlighted for you and easy to find. And it's written really well. And what I really, really like is I have not found, and maybe it's just written so well I didn't see anything, but I haven't seen any like typos. It feels like today, 
um, I can buy a rule set from a pretty big company, I won't name any, but I see it often, lots of typos, and sometimes, you know, the company's like, well, we'll just fix that in errata and, and repost it and stuff. And it's like, wow, back here, I don't think they had quite that luxury to post things online for erratas and living rules and whatnot. So they had to get it right the first time. So this has actually been a joy to read. I like the design notes. That, that to me, really helped to solidify the mechanics that I was reading about. You know, why are we checking for distances this way? Why is a rule written this way? It's to accommodate, you know, the AI or... Here was something that happened historically, so here's why we're trying to, to, you know, here's how we're replicating that historical item in the rules. Like, for instance, when it talks about torpedo attacks, it says the reason why the United States torpedo values are so low is because there's possibilities that you are going to run into a lot of duds. Because early in the war, American torpedoes were cruddy. And that's, you know, replicated here, which is why you see disparities, uh, you know, just differences, I should say, between like American torpedo values and Japanese torpedo values. So it's all in here. It, it's really, really good. And, uh, you know, the graphics might not be full color that you see today, but there's enough color in the examples that it's just really easy to follow. So I just want to say... I wish this company was still making games today, or, you know, at least have this active, because I think this is a really good example for folks on how rules should be done. So again, it covers, the basic rules covers the basics of movement, as far as how to draw and determine the way the Japanese units will move. There's a, uh, uh, you know, a special segment that they follow. It explains the phases of movement. Um, it explains then into like the torpedo attacks that we were talking about, how to determine that. And it does say in the rules that the basic system is fairly simple and straightforward on torpedo resolution, but the standard rules and advanced rules can flesh that out a little bit more for you if you need it. So after movement is torpedoes, and then after torpedo attacks, it gets into gunnery combat. And there are some comments that the gunnery combat might be complicated, but Again, I don't think it's really that quite complicated. I'll show you some of the, the cards that you have. What's interesting is that instead of having a lot of car, like, um, you know, percentile dice, a lot of games are probably using like dice sixes and stuff, but um, this uses an interesting system. Instead of having like maybe one chart with 100 probabilities, they are replicating all the different probabilities by having different damage cards or attack cards for the different type of... I'll show you that in a second. It's, it, I actually found it more fascinating than complicated. Um, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool how they were trying to do things back in the day when maybe percentile dice weren't all that rage at the time. But anyway, after you go to uh, the gunnery and the damage, then it talks about how you assess damage and how damage affects the ships as you move forward. And then at the very end, again, is a couple pages that talk about the scenarios themselves. Uh, you know, kind of like overview thought process behind the scenarios. There's a campaign outline. So, and then at the very end, design notes. All very fascinating reading. And it's really about 20 pages of rules, which even by today's standard is not... Not that much. That's actually really good for a game. Now, where people say it starts to get really complicated, though, is when you dive into the standard rules. Now, I will admit that, only because I haven't really dove in here, but it does add... Let's see, advanced game rules. The standard game rules stop at about page 54. So, yeah, that probably ratchets up a lot of things that you need to account for. So yeah, I could see how the complexity starts to go up. I'll give you that much. But a lot of topics are covered here, even if we don't look at every single page. I don't want to bore you with that, but uh, covers the sequence of play, formations, orders, movement, detection, Japanese hidden forces, standard combat. So if you have those concepts down from the basic game, I'm pretty sure that this is just adding some layers of, of simulation to the game. I would almost 
bet that you could, and I've done this with other games that have basic rules and advanced rules, is just take things that look interesting from the like the standard rules and just start adding in those things to your basic game. So you don't have to just automatically jump to the more complex. So I'm actually thinking that if I get into this more, I'll do the basic game and then over time I could just start adding in some of the advanced rules. Oh, game concept. Oh, there's the stop here. Now that you've read the game concepts, looked at the different counters and things, the components of the game, go back, read the basic game. Then when you're done, it recommends even playing the basic game several, several times. It even says later on in the basic book, it says here's a rule that you can add in and play again just to kind of introduce a standard game element. So once you feel really good with the basic game, then you can pop into the standard game rules. And again, I would say I'll probably read through it and then just find the, find the rules I enjoy and add them in slowly. Yeah, because even in the basic game, you look at the map and everything is treated as ocean. You every, Even the land. It's just basically just one big open map of water. Here you start to add in like land, shoal, and map edges. So you could add in that part, if nothing else, but add in land and shoal and map edges. Uh, detection. Detection in the basic game is pretty simple. Uh, the visual range is about 10 hexes for Japanese, 7 hexes for Americans, but then you can add in more complexities to that. There's radar detection on top of visual detection. So it does add in some more stuff. Surprises, force sizes, there's some standard combat, so you can add to the complexity of that. Gunnery combat. So a lot of this is just kind of adding nuances to your your standard game. That's it. Nothing nothing too much. Uh, maybe when you play you could just add in the advanced gunnery but leave out advanced torpedo attacks until you got advanced gunnery down. So I think it's all very doable to just introduce those elements. But again it's nice to see they have rules um, you know probably for just about everything you would need for those kind of small engagements. And then it goes into some scenarios. A lot of scenarios near the end here. Hypothetical. That was another thing I read here. It has a bunch of historical vessels and ships in the game. But then it also adds in some not quite historical. So you can try out hypothetical missions and stuff. And this was cool too. Um, he had in here an advertisement still in, with the game. In a lot of these games, I remember seeing in stores when I was a kid, Open Fire, Battle Ham. And these are games I hear about now, but are out of print. You could probably find them on eBay, but still really loved by folks. But what got me was the prices. Oh, man. Looking at a game, $32, $24. Now, today I look at that and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, why can't I buy the Gulf Strike Update modules for $7? Well, back then, that $7 inflation, that probably felt like you were spending 30 bucks on a module. I mean, today you can look at some games coming out from companies. They're like 100 bucks for a game. Here, I'm still looking at 35 bucks. So maybe it felt like 100 bucks back in the day. But I was like, man, I miss those prices. Darn inflation, Nightmare on Elm Street, Dr. Ruth's Game of Good Sex. Yeah, where can we find a copy of that? Oh, there's a Playboy one. Well, we'll hit eBay. Here's some more Pacific games. There's the Pacific War. There's a France, Omaha Beachhead, Panzer Command, Lee vs. Grant. 20 bucks, Lee vs. Grant. Civil War, 20 bucks. The whole war recreated for 20 bucks. Pretty cool. All right, so advertisement. Uh, this here was a blank card. Oh, wait, no, I said blank cardboard, but it's not. You unfold it. Battle movement display, this is where this chart is used to help you plot out how uh, naval for Japanese naval forces move. I haven't, like I said, I haven't played yet. I read through the basic rules, so I don't have this quite down exactly how to use. But look at this, right here on the side. It's got me a little basic, basic game reminder rules right there how to use this. So, very cool. Um, this is nice. The colors are good. Is a very well presented map for this. It reminds me of some of the new games like, what is that, by John Butterfield? There's like um, Iwo Jima, the Normandy, where his maps have all these 
icons to help you determine where things happen and how it happens. So it kind of remind me of that. So that's very cool. We're going to keep that handy. I feel like I should be wearing gloves to protect the items here. Here's the map. Let's see. I'll try to open this up a bit, but uh, I don't think I'll unfold all of it. Looks like I could easily get this to fit on my table, though. So playing this and showing the whole map I don't think will be a problem at all. Yeah, I think this would be good so when we play through. But this is a great looking map. Uh, it is paper. Um, it's not card like a, a cardboard, what do you want to call that? The, a board. It's not a board, it's a paper map. But that's fine because I could probably fit this in my, um, my poster poster display where it's got a nice little plexiglass covering it or plastic whatever you want to call it and we can play on that but the colors are good easy to read um, I would say this is just about as good as any map you get today in fact I think I've this looks better than some maps I get today it's pretty I really hate talking about like price points but you know back I don't know how much this cost when it originally came out but the artwork here is really good. I've gotten some games these days where it feels like they've just really skimped on map artwork and even though this is mostly water the few bits and pieces they have of land the artwork is really nice. I like that there's a sample ship counter up here it explains all the pieces. We'll look at some of the counters and show you some of the cool things. Uh, even for a game I'll have to look. What year was this? 1988? So this actually has some pretty good counter work for back in the day, even though it's kind of that classic, you know, just a black icon. Oh, you can't even see it. I'm showing you stuff. You can't even see it. There it is. So even though this is like a classic looking black icon, it's still very good artwork and all the information on it is easy to read. Okay, so let's, let's put that away. So you get a really nice map. It's not a double-sided map, just one map for all the playing that you're doing, but you are playing in one specific area, so you don't need much more map beyond that. Here are the gunnery cards. Now I know some people might be like, oh, they're being held by rubber bands. I'm gonna see if I have some small snack bags or something and maybe put them in snack bags because sometimes I think rubber bands put too much pressure on the middle and it bends the cards. So I might, I might upgrade Tom's box a little bit and put these in little plastic baggies to keep them separate. But these are the original cards. And the gunnery deck. So this is what I thought was awesome about the gunnery deck. So if I just zoom in a little bit here so you can see what I'm talking about. I thought these were cool because when you add up the the gunnery points, if you will, all of the, the weapons have like a combat value. You add it all together and that's how much damage you do and you compare that how much damage you did and then cross-reference that with the type of target you're hitting uh, simplifying it but it tells you how much damage let's see what is this the BB deck ah. and what you do is there you're gonna kinda mix them up and when you're fighting you're like oh my my battleship shot at something and its combined combat value is whatever 26 then look across at the type of target and then you get a uh, damage point now I'm looking at this and I've already forgotten what the SML was for I know that to me sounds like small medium large but um, I'd have to look again but that was kind of the basic of it. But so here's what I thought was cool was so instead of like modern games, everything is like maybe on a chart or some kind of big table of percentile dice rolls and whatnot to get around the lack of a percentile charts and things. You just have all these cards. So I wonder if somebody who is a mathematician could just take these cards, the data sets on the cards and put it into some kind of percentile chart. It's possible you probably could and that way you wouldn't have to worry about losing cards or hurting your cards at all but that was basically it and then once you get your your combat attack value and then the number of damage that you did 
you set the card aside and then the next time the battleship shoots at something you draw the next one but yeah you get some with lots of data and value on there and then some you know well that one has quite a bit so these cards are giving you random look at there that would have been a bad shot like all misses right not every time you shoot something are you gonna score a hit well anyway I just want to take a moment to show you. I just thought that was really cool that each of these cards gives you such a wide range of potential hits, misses, little bit of damage, lots of damage. So I thought that's pretty cool. And all based on the type of ship you're shooting at. So let me go ahead and put that back. There's a couple other things to take a peek at. Uh, okay, I'll figure out how to work a rubber band in a little bit. All right, next thing that we have in the box. And again, I thought this was kind of cool. Here, let me shift up a little bit. Kind of going back to the fact that these are classic games back when maybe people having computers and personal printers wasn't that, you know, a common a thing. Nowadays, I could just maybe pop onto the company's website or Board Game Geek or something and find uh, the equivalent file that I could download and then I could just print off these whenever I want. This is harking back to the day where, yeah, they did include a pad of the ship forms for you. To play the game and then maybe when you ran out you'd have to contact the company and get more yeah I, now i could just photocopy one of these on my printer and print them out whenever i want plus i did find these on board game geek where you can download them they had the americans and the japanese this side tracks your cruisers involved the battleships here and then it's got your destroyers where you can mark off their damage when they take a certain amount of damage that affects your ability to fight so for example here I think you can see that um, these are your damage boxes so when you take a certain amount of damage uh, if you cross off the one you're basically now at one point of damage that affects your gunnery that affects your movement the next point of damage is a three uh, which it would affect on these damage charts it says when you have your damage value if I'm at three damage even though that's the second box there's a three I have to like come down three so damage will affect your gunnery um, you also reduce your movement by that and then if you're on this last box where it's got a number in parentheses that's the new permanent speed of that ship they did call out that the a historical ship here the California battleship California it has a one in parentheses so that's like the only ship in the game where if you damage it enough it has a permanent speed of one and versus everybody else has a, a new permanent speed of two these circles represent your torpedo loadouts no reloads the Japanese forces have reloads which will show but in the basic game um, primarily the destroyers some cruisers have torpedoes for the Americans but as you use them you cross them off the two is how many shots are in the, the salvo. And then the P lets you know if it's port or if it's center or starboard. And then that, you know, what firing arc you can use it in. So just, you know, the basic information you need to play. And then on the counter itself has all the other combat data. But so there you go. Now on the back side, this chart is used in the two player game. How that's used, I don't know yet. I don't know if I'll really have a chance to play the two-player version of it, but here's the two-player game sheets that you need right on the back side. So there's your American sheets. Then we have the Japanese sheet. Same information. Looks like I got some pencil marks here, so someone's given this attempt at a playthrough at some point. But lots of destroyers, some heavy cruisers, some light cruisers. They got some battleships too. But same information. Here's the torpedo data. When they fire, they mark it off. The difference here, though, is they have these shaded in circles. Those are the reloads. In the basic game, you don't worry about the reloads. They just get their one shot uh, or however many here they got of the non-shaded salvos. 
but in the standard game and advanced game you do get reloads so Japanese had fantastic torpedoes it's another thing too in the game it takes into account American torpedoes have short and medium range they can fire out to and then Japanese torpedoes can go out to long and extreme range which is uh, you know several hexes in each of those bands so Japanese had fantastic torpedoes hidden forces that probably don't need that in the basic game but on the back then is the data form that you use in a two-player game to track information. So there's two pads of player aids. Then we have, I'm going to pull this out carefully. This is where people start to see the game to be complex. Let me just push this out a little bit more. The player aids. Now you can tell this is a classic game. It doesn't have like the fancy glossy player aids of today. Uh, but these are extremely well put together and color coded very, very nicely. Uh, even by today's standards, I think these look great. For the basic game, luckily, all you need is this one chart. It's got you know information on the front side, information on the back side. So this one I could tell was pulled off because Tom or someone at some point were getting ready to play the basic game. And all you need is this one page. So that's great. So there's everything you need there. Then the rest of this, this, this is where someone might say, but look how complex the game is. So I'm not going to say the game does not have complexity, but like a lot of solo games, a lot of the AI and things that you do are chart driven. Decisions are made by, you know, the charts, the dice rolls, things that you do, uh, which it does require some dice rolls, but um, I'll have to get my own dice. Tom's using these dice and something else. But uh, they're all double-sided here. So we'll just kind of flip through so you can see one side. And then we'll flip it over so you can see the other side. Here's the detection table. We have the uh, a more advanced torpedo combat table. And there's a gunnery combat tables. On the basic game, here we have like a page... And look at that, a nice Japanese target allocation summary, right? A lot of, all the rules for the a Japanese AI here on the card. And then down here, the basic game, little segment on the AI for the Japanese. So the gunnery here, instead of one whole card, just fits down here. Torpedoes got a similar treatment. Instead of one entire card, they got a basic card down here. But expand it out when you get into standard and advanced. And chart six scenario generation charts which I think that's cool so having not read it it does appear you can continue playing this game forever because you can just make your own scenarios ship availability charts again probably for like scenario creation and whatnot so a lot of these charts I'm starting to see don't necessarily impact immediate gameplay but you know advanced uh, standard sequence of play track Okay, you probably want that for the standard game. There's a hidden force display. And lastly, then there's a Japanese hidden force display. <clears throat> All right, we'll flip through, take a look on the back side, and then we'll try not to use these too much. I don't want these to separate. But uh, here's Japanese availability, US ship availability, two player game information. Uh, Japan, Japanese historical ships listing, historical, some A historical, again, just another like ship listing, um, random event table, effects that could happen from the random events. Here's the combat sequence. This is on the back side too, so two two sided combat effects, yeah, gunnery combat, surprise torpedo attacks. That's on the back of the torpedo combat. Hidden forces, hidden forces available table. And then Japanese formations and movement. And then there's one more on the back here. There's a Japanese withdrawal table. Oh, nope, that's it. And that was on the back of the formations and movement. So a lot of play aids, but again, I think they look really well and they're still holding together. So. I'm not going to pull those off or anything to play the basic game. We'll just leave it like it is. 
And then there's counters here. And a couple of counters look like they've already fallen out. Not my fault. Not my fault. I didn't do it. But we'll zoom that in just a little bit for you. All right. So some of the data here without zooming in too much, what I liked on this, I thought was kind of cute. I don't know if it's needed necessarily, but certainly not bad, is it does have on the ships a P and an F. P for port, S for starboard, so a little reminder when you're rotating them, if you say I'm doing a port turn, it reminds you which way to turn. But that's a nice little polite thing. Uh, combat factors for front and back because some ships, you know, you got two turrets up front, one turret in the back. Some ships you might got two turrets up front, two turrets in the back. But there's your combat values and then you can add them together if you're shooting a full broadside. Um, <clears throat> tells you if it's a destroyer, ship name, and then their speed. The important things, right? Battleship California is pretty slow, but speed of four. Hidden force movement, won't need that in the basic game. So one of these ships is floating around in the box, but got some heavy cruisers, light cruisers, lots of destroyers, some more destroyers. Yeah, and then there was a couple battleships moving in here, some convoys, and then your Japanese counters. But it'd be the same information. The 8-3, well that number I don't remember. I don't think that was the full broadside number. That was something else. It could be a broadside number. Oh, there's a secondary number. Uh, the basic game does not use the secondaries of the vessel, so that might be their secondary gunnery value. I didn't, I don't remember exactly because, again, secondaries aren't going to be used in the basic game. So maybe if I get onto the more standard game, I'll be more concerned about that middle number. But I think off the top of my head, that's the secondary gunnery value on those ships. And then they're double sided, and the explosion silhouette. After you do your gunnery combat, you flip it. That just lets you know the ship is fired. I think I saw another video. They weren't sure at first if that bandit was damaged or if that had fired. But that just means it's fired. So there's one set of counters. Here's another set of counters. Uh, but yeah, these attacks are important. Cause there's attack targets. So um, looks like there's one. Okay, there's Japanese for the red, blue for American. So... A lot of this is determining who's shooting at what and tracking that. So put the attacker A next to a ship, put target B so you know, or target A so you know, attacker A is shooting at target A kind of a thing. So you got trackers for that. Those look like hands on a clock. I don't think that's in the basic game. The ahead they said, yeah, that's in a two-player game, the ahead. But here's some of the orders you can give, reminders that you put on a task force. If they're doing like a 60 degree turn or moving ahead or whatever they're doing. Um, admirals that you can add to flagships. I see the Japanese admirals. I think the American admirals might be on the other one. But um, I thought that was kind of cool too. The command and control. Oh, here they are. Ainsworth, or Ainsworth Scott, Wright, Walker, Lee. Um, you're going to take a... Admiral, based on scenario, stick it on a flagship and a task force, and then how the Americans do things, they, they're, their doctrine for moving is a little bit different than the Japanese, because Japanese follow the AI movement, but the American player, you're kind of in control, but there's a chance that because they didn't have as strict a doctrine, apparently, as the Japanese had at the time, sometimes some of your American admirals might go off on their own. So the task forces in relation to their distance to your your main admiral of the fleet there's a chance they might go and do their own thing and they have a rule uh, a role that you check for that and then you might assign them a different order than you know so everybody else might be doing an s turn but you know admiral lee who's 20 hexes away he might go and do his own thing so they have dice rolls for that but then little markers to track the orders that are given and then we got one more sheet here of markers, some damage markers, if it's sunk, on fire, illuminated speed markers. Normally your task force moves at the speed of the slowest vessel, but you can go slower than that. So they have little handy dandy markers to put out there to remind you what they're doing. All very cool. So just some nice informational markers. Action chits. Yeah, we'll have to make sure he's got those. So. Um, a lot of these will be blank in the basic game. You have uh, one 
action shit which says like combat and then you have five which are blank and so throughout the different phases you draw it just to see if act, you know combat takes place or not oh he does have a dice in here I didn't think he had any dice in here at first but here's some of his blank counters that have fallen out or he punched might have punched some of these out there's his combat shit Japan Detect, probably, I don't think we need the Japan Detect in the basic game, but let's see here. U.S. Detect, maybe you do. I don't know. But we'll pull these out. But the other thing the game came with, which I thought was very cool, which again is not something you see very often these days, but a counter tray. And there's the die 10. I stand corrected. There is a dice included, and it's a die 10, not a standard die 6. So Victory Games, they were very much ahead of their time. So that's awesome. I'm just going to set that aside because in here, Games and Parts Price List. Look at that. So if you're missing something, Avalon Hill, Victory Game Simulations. Nice. Just a nice little sneak back in the past. Oops, don't want to open that. 20 bucks for wooden ships. Wooden ships Iron Man. You can get a map board for 10. Waterloo. Uh, oh, complexity of game. I can get wooden. I guess wooden ships in Iron Man at some point was 20 bucks. Get up front for 25. Now you can get it all printed off of like drive-through cards for much, much more than that. So again, just a cool little sneak back to 1988 kind of makes you wish that had you known now what you know knew then no nope, no now no what is that if you knew then what you know now you would have bought all these and kept them yeah very cool how to compute your shipping call in on your rotary dial phone and then last here's a feedback card oh why well, I could just go onto their website and tell them what I think but they didn't have a whole lot of internet, so nice. Good old fashioned dead tree snail mail. There you go. What did you think? I thought it was great. Nice game. Thanks for sharing it there, Victory Games. So I don't know. I doubt if I sent that, it would go anywhere. All right, I'll put some of these counters back on top of the counter tray. But that is the contents and some thoughts that I have there of, of some of the reading I've done and components for Tokyo Express. So what do we get? Reverse unboxing. Let's put it all back. You get a counter sheet of, well, three, three counter sheets. There's some admin markers, some more admin markers, and then the ships that you need. You have a pad of play charts, which I think, I think there was nine... There's 10 double-sided chart player aids of charts that you need to play the game. 10 of those. You got one pad of Japanese ships. You have one pad to track your American ship data forms. I guess call that data forms there. You have one full color map. You have one movement, battle movement display is like a two-folded cardboard display. There was another little flyer of other games. You get a standard game book. You also get a basic game book. And then there were four sets of combat data cards. So based on the type of ship firing versus the type of target so I'll put those in and then there's the box. and I'll zoom that back out and then you got the box cover so that's everything that comes in Tokyo Express anyway I hope you enjoy that uh, well I don't know how long we took on that but I hope you enjoyed that look inside Tokyo Express maybe that answers some questions you had about the game and I'm hoping that I can get some gameplay for this in and I'll film that experience as well. If you have any questions or comments, you know, feel free to leave that and we'll see you on the next video.
Thanks again. Bye.